Research Foundation monthly Meet the Scientists webinar. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host and moderator for today's webinar. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is dedicated to funding research around the world to identify the causes, improve treatments, and ultimately develop cures and preventative techniques for mental illness. The Foundation has awarded over $300 million in NARSAD research grants over 25 years. Today, Dr. Carlos Zarati will present a webinar entitled Rapid Acting, well, actually, Ketamine and Next Generation Therapies with Rapid Antidepressant Effects. Dr. Zarati is the chief of the section of the neurobiology and treatment of mood disorders at the National Institute of Mental Health and a clinical professor at George Washington University. He has pioneered studies that are leading to the development of revolutionary new treatments for depression. With a strong focus on the pathophysiology of severe mental illnesses, Dr. Zarati's goal is to develop better treatments particularly for patients living with depression and bipolar disorder. Dr. Zarati received a NARSAD Young Investigator Grant in 1996 and an Independent Investigator Grant in 2005 and is also the recipient of the Mood Disorder Outstanding Achievement Prize in 2011. That prize has been renamed the Colvin Prize. Um, and he's received, he received that award for his work on ketamine. This will be an interactive event. We will start with Dr. Zarati's presentation, followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the question tab of, for the, on the webinar control panel. You can submit your questions throughout the presentation. As your moderator, I'll present your questions to Dr. Zarati and we'll address as many of them as possible. Now, I'm very, very pleased to present and very excited to hear this presentation by Dr. Carlos Serrati. Carlos, the stage is yours. Thank you. Hi, Jeff. Uh, thank, thanks for the introduction, and I'd like to welcome the uh, audience to um, uh, this webinar seminar. And um, what I'll talk about is ketamine and the next generation therapies with a the rapid antidepressant effects. I will talk about our clinical work and also where, head in, where we are heading in terms of developing novel and new treatments uh, for our patients with severe mood disorders. This is my disclosure. I work for the uh, National Institute of Mental Health and I'll be talking about the off-label use of ketamine and also scopolamine. Well, it's clear that we do have a number of uh, treatments for our patients. We have over 20 antidepressants, we have many antipsychotic drugs, and we have many anticonvulsants. But many of our patients do not respond adequately despite receiving adequate dose and duration of these treatments. For that reason, it's estimated that about 30 to 40 percent of our patients suffer from treatment-resistant depression. They do not respond adequately to our current treatments. So that has led industry, academia, and also the government to look for new targets. And we refer to this as mechanistically distinct drug targets. And we can see in the, in the 1950s, there were about two drug targets for depression and for schizophrenia, whereas for heart disease, it was about two to four. Well, after 50 years or nearly five decades, we have not made significant, significant progress in the number of new drug targets Despite considerable efforts, people have tried, but we have not uh, been able to develop new treatments, and that uh, comes in part from the complexity of our disorders. Whereas we can see for heart disease, there are over 15 new drug targets, and that has resulted in significant impact on health. One million less deaths by cardiac uh, events uh, in one year. Whereas we, n we have not decreased uh, the incidence or prevalence of any of our major disorders, uh, severe mental disorders. So we have to do better. 
most of the treatments that we have uh, based uh, on antidepressants are, are modeled after serotonin and norepinephrine, and we refer to them uh, as our serotonin reuptake inhibitors. The story is much worse even for bipolar disorder, except for lithium. All the treatments we have for bipolar disorder are from repurposed drugs, anticonvulsants for epilepsy and antipsychotic psychotics for our patients with schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. We have yet to develop a single drug for bipolar disorder based on an understanding of the molecular underpinnings of the disease, or for that matter, effective, our effective treatments. So that brings me to an outline of today's talk, which also is an outline of our program and where our research is uh, targeted. So we will look for developing new treatments for treatment-resistant depression. We'll also look at coming up with new drug targets for bipolar disorder. The third point of today's talk will be lag of onset of antidepressant effects. We will be looking for developing treatments that work in a few hours or a day as opposed to weeks or months uh, with our current treatments. The next point is that there are no drugs developed for se severe suicidal ideation, so one of our goals is to come up with new treatments for severe suicidal ideation so that we may intervene very rapidly. And finally, the lack of biomarkers, those characteristics that will help us predict who will respond to a particular treatment, and we refer to that as individualizing or personalizing our treatment. And the second goal of biomarkers is to come up with the brain signatures that would help us develop drugs that are similar to ketamine-like compounds. Well, let's start with the first problem, the lag of onset of antidepressant effects. It takes weeks or months for a current antidepressant to kick in or take effect. This figure represents the life course of an individual with bipolar disorder. We see in blue major depressive episodes where with time, the episodes become more severe and last longer. In yellow, the well-being or euthymic intervals, and in green, hypomanic episodes. We can see here with every major depressive episode, it has a considerable toll on an individual's life, on their family, occupation, and also there's a risk of suicidal behavior. We take one of these major depressive episodes and we see here what the natural course of illness is in the beginning of the depressive uh, illness. We see that in general, major depressive episodes last about nine months. And even without treatment, they will go away, especially in the beginning of um, the illness. What we do with our treatments, in this case, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, citalopram, is we shorten the natural course of illness so that people achieve a remission, that means significant improvement within 10 to 14 weeks instead of the nine months. We see here two problems. One is very low remission rates. Two-thirds are not remitting in the general long time it takes to achieve remission while people are suffering. What we expect with the next generation of treatments, which we're working on, is to produce antidepressant effects in a matter of hours instead of weeks or months. And for that matter, if we were to achieve that, we can reduce the length, the severity, and duration of these episodes of depression, as well as we think decrease the disruption to one's personal, occupational life, and also decrease the risk of suicidal behavior while increasing functioning and well-being. That is our goal for the next generation of treatments. One system that stands out as uh, potential for achieving this goal of rapid antidepressant effects is the glutamate system, which is highlighted here. You can see here the presynaptic neuron, the postsynaptic neuron, and this is the glia. These little white dots represent glutamate. They're synthesized, stored in these vesicles in the brain and the neurons, and then they're released into the synaptic space. This system is tightly regulated because glutamate is very important to learning and memory, but up to a certain point. When the concentrations are too high, that may lead to de uh, neurodegenerative effects or atrophy. There are ways of regulating glutamate. One is at the level of glia, excitatory amino acid transporter, and this is an interesting target that we are pursuing now for depression. The other is the metabotropic receptor, which is the thermostat, releases the amount of glutamate in the system. If it's too hot or too cold, regulates the system. 
There's also these other receptors, NMDA, AMPA receptor, and we're going to talk much more about that. It is the interplay between these two receptors that seems to be very important to the rapid antidepressant effects of ketamine. Here we can see that this system is uh, very important to learning, memory, and plasticity, and we can he see here that spines, those are the end points here, we can see the synapses. And depending on the number of synapses, that is involved in a rapid antidepressant effects. So we see that in depression or stress, the number of spines or density decreases, and with ketamine can rapidly increase the number of synapses and spines and facilitate this normal process. We can also see from the system the number of targets we can pursue to more appropriately regulate glutamate uh, levels. Now this slide explains why there is a delay in onset of our antidepressant effects. We see here serotonin and norepinephrine, our current antidepressants such as cy citalopram, Selex, or Prozac, can rapidly increase these neurotransmitter with a minute. But why does it take weeks or months? Well, there's what we refer to as an initiation and adaptation paradigm. You initiate, you buy the, the neurotransmitters bind to these receptors, but then there have to be a series of changes within these proteins and cascades. But what probably really matters in the end are these end targets, NMDA and AMP, and I came back to it. It's this interplay that seems important. So we can more directly target NMDA with a drug such as ketamine. Ketamine is seen here in this figure. It binds within the NMDA receptor at the PCP pencyclidine uh, site. So the analogy here I like to use is our current, and if we were to, to fix a leaky faucet, we can go to the washer, stop the leak in the kitchen sink. But what we are doing with our current antidepressant is decreasing this link by shutting down the water plant. Eventually, with time, the water will decrease for the cities and the towns and the villages and the houses and the neighborhoods until it gets to your kitchen sink. The net effect is the same. We do it more directly with a drug such as ketamine. There are synonyms of uh, ketamine is also known as ketaject, ketacep. It's a drug class of dissociative anesthetic, which means profound analgesia with, uh, uh, with superficial sleep. It is similar to PCP, but 10 to 50 times less potent. And it's widely used as a tranquilizer by veterinarians or diagnostic procedure in emergency room settings. We see also that ketamine is very commonly used in the elderly and in children. But because it binds to the PCP site, it causes dissociative side effects or the psychomimetic effects, which I'll talk about in, in a minute. And it's also used recreationally. We have designed a series of studies as well as others uh, asking a question. If I use ketamine and directly target this NMDA receptor, thus avoiding all this traffic, would that bring about rapid antidepressant effects in hours as opposed to weeks and months? And the answer is yes. Because of ethical reasons, because of the side effects I mentioned, we gave one infusion of ketamine and sub-anesthetic doses, and I'll talk about that study in a minute. So let's talk about the psychological and physiological effects of ketamine. These effects generally are mild as we prescribe low doses of ketamine, and it's well controlled because it's an infusion. We see psychological effects when we give ketamine in a research setting, decreased awareness of the environment, there's sedation, a dreamlike state, and generally most patients have some uh, experience where they do not really communicate during the, the infusion, have this intense experience that they have difficulty putting into words. Some patients may have out-of-body experiences or uh, the sounds might sound more faded or more distant. Others might have some symptoms such as dizziness or paranoia, but generally that doesn't happen often. There are physiological effects where blood pressure and heart rate goes up during the infusion. If one stops the infusion, all these things rapidly revert. In terms of tolerance, dependence, and withdrawal effects, it, ketamine is generally ranked as uh, a drug that people will use and they like. Uh, there are generally no withdrawal effects unless you're a chronic user and use high doses on a regular basis. These are the, two, the studies I mentioned, whether if we directly target in the receptor, will we bring about a rapid antidepressant effect? And the answer is yes. 
we can see rapid antidepressant effects within two hours in patients who had failed on average seven antidepressants, they had been 30 years ill, their current episode of depression was three years, 60% had, fail, had uh, failed the ECT or electroconvulsive therapy, 60% had um, also uh, had prior suicide attempts. This is with one infusion, low doses, and you see that response is maintained for several weeks, one to two weeks. And if you look towards the right, we see our current antidepressant, about 62 to 65% responds within eight weeks to bupropion or Wellbutrin, then Lafaxin. But we can induce as rap more rapid antidepressant effects, which are comparable within six hours to one day. And more importantly, if you remember that 33% remission at 10 to 14 weeks with our current SSRI treatment, we see that happens on day one. 33% achieve remission in one day. So this study has been replicated not only in major depressive disorder, but also in bipolar depression in two studies, where one of the troubles we have with antidepressants and bipolar depression is there is a risk for uh, cycle acceleration and switch and not all patients benefit uh, from antidepressants in those who have bipolar disorder. So there have been a number of uh, replication studies. Um, we see here these are crossover control studies. And finally, the study just completed uh, by James Moore and Sanjay Matthew, funded by NIMH, found that at, at 72 hours, 60% achieved a response. This is very similar to the pre, uh, previous studies, which is quite remarkable of this compound as you see a very reproducible effect, which really speaks to uh, that this drug, ketamine, is targeting an important target uh, for depression. Now, in our original studies, as well as um, by other investigators, we noted that suicidal ideation improved and with, with ketamine treatment, of course, in the context of depression. And here we see that ketamine is quite, uh, that uh, suicide is quite important. We know it's, a, it's an emergent condition that requires immediate treatment. And the highest risk of uh, suicide occurs within starting an antidepressant. We have seen also an increase in the number of visits to emergency room departments because of suicide ideation or suicide attempts. And we see uh, that now there are more deaths by suicide than by combat in the military, particularly in the Army. So we decided to look more systematically at the, the use of ketamine and treatment-resistant depression. Remember, 60% of our patients had previous suicide attempts. And we see those with high suicide ideation and versus low, we can see an improvement in severe suicide ideation within 40 minutes, under an hour, which lasts most of the week. Whereas those with low suicidal ideation, we don't see a significant worsening. In bipolar depression, in a controlled study, we also found that this was the case. Within 40 minutes, rapid improvement maintained for a good part of the week, where there was no significant change in suicidal thinking in the control condition. This is very important and could have an immediate impact on public health because this would may minimize the number of people who need to be admitted, would give a, a, a period where one can institute an intervention such as a medication or a psychotherapeutic intervention or even arrange out, uh, outpatient care um, and, and so could have a considerable impact. Now where are we heading with, the, uh, with ketamine in terms of research and treatment? Well, I've outlined here what I think is going to be happening. Ketamine is being used in clinical practice, and I'll touch on that. It is being used as an off-label indication. People have tried different things, um, as typical when, it when it's being used um, in the community. Some have used repeat uh, infusions three times a week, such as ECT. Some have looked at different doses of ketamine because what is being used is 0.5 milligram, kilogram over 40 minutes. Some give slower infusions, arguing that the psychomimetic dissociative side effects are much lower. Some have tried to extend the effects of ketamine by using lithium or standard antidepressant treatments. Um, 
most of the these interventions are mimicking trying to maintain the response of EC2 electroconvulsive therapy, and some are jumpstarting uh, current antidepressants. Now, unfortunately, I can't give you any definitive answer what works best, but these uh, um, interventions are being studied and, and utilized in the community. The second point is, uh, let's look at trying to develop ketamine-like drug without those dissociative side effects I mentioned. I'll dis discuss that in a minute. The next is trying to thoroughly understand ketamine's mechanism across a, a system uh, a biology level from anywhere from genes uh, to circuits to, to come up with what are the circuits or the signatures important in its response so as to develop better treatments. And finally, uh, we talk about ketamine, but uh, there are many metabolites of ketamine, and perhaps some of these drugs could be developed to ketamine-like drugs. So here, there are already many clinics around the country that are prescribing ketamine in an off-label manner. I cannot give you information um, on um, if there is any uh, consistency on how it's being administered, as there are no yet developed guidelines but just to mention that this is uh, already happening. There has been use with uh, ketamine in terms of trying to maintain its response. There's a study done by Jay Morris and colleague, and we see here um, what we find out from uh, ketamine, given it three times a week for two weeks, is the following. Pretty much what you get in the first day is uh, what you're going to get in terms of response. Very rarely do people respond after the first infusion, Second is with each subsequent infusion, it seems to maintain the previous level of improvement. Down means greater improvement. The next point is that with regards to the side effects, they don't get worse with subsequent infusions of ketamine, and they don't get better. What you got with the first infusion generally remains um, consistent throughout the series of infusion, but the level of expectation, for example, of anxiety when someone goes for a surgical procedure, as normally one, one would experience, um, one becomes familiar and knows what to expect with it. And we do finally know that after, and this pertains to treatment resistant depression, after the last infusion of ketamine, um, most people stay well for an additional three weeks. Some can stay well for even longer periods of time with just um, the infusion. Also important to highlight that besides the antidepressants and anti-suicidal effects, in the context of severe depression, we see significant anxiolytic effects that has led to studies in obsessive compulsive disorder showing anti-OCD effects. And also there's a recent study in post-traumatic stress disorder showing um, improvement in dissociative symptoms. Taking advantage of the studies we have done, we have pulled this to have a better understanding of uh, how robust the effects of ketamine are suicidation. And we can see here really significant improvements within 40 minutes lasting most of the week in patients uh, with, with significant suicidation lasting um, the better course of one week. There have been um, some uh, people who have asked, um, does it induce a manic switch? or does it worsen dissociative symptoms in those with a history of PTSD or trauma? And the answer is no. We don't see a significant increase in the switch to mania in patients with bipolar disorder. We can see here that the level of manic symptoms, 12, is referred to as hypomanic. We're very low here. Of course, this is one infusion. Uh, one rem what remains to be determined is repeat infusions leads to a greater risk of effective switch. But so far, we don't see that. The next is, in a person with a history of trauma and PTSD symptoms, are there increased dissociative side effects? And the answer appears to be no in um, our sample. The other is, can we use clinical or treatment or demographic uh, characteristics to, pre uh, to predict who might respond to uh, Ketamine, and the answer is yes. It appears that there are some that might be useful. That ex explains anywhere from an 8 to 16 percent of the variance of response. That means the magnitude of improvement one could achieve. Towards the upper right, we see at 230 minutes that uh, that uh, weight or body uh, or BMI index, we'll refer to it as weight, 
it significantly improve, uh, relates to uh, improvement at four hours and at day one. That means the greater the weight of an individual, the better the response, and that perhaps has to do with dose. Higher doses is associated with response. That also could mean um, that one might have a greater risk of side effects as one increases the dose. Another that predicts sustained effects of ketamine appears to be a family history of alcohol, alcohol use disorders, both at day one and ongoing effects at uh, day seven. And uh, ketamine, as well as alcohol, both block NMDA glutamate receptors. And there is research already showing that people who use alcohol have a different subjective response to alcohol if they have a family history of alcoholism. So perhaps some of the variance is explained by genetics in terms of uh, response to ketamine. Now, number two, develop ketamine-like drugs without the dissociative side effects. So there are many companies now looking at subunit selective compounds that affect NR2B or NR2A2B or metabotropic receptors. And this, this slide summarizes some of the programs that are ongoing. Others, uh, such as J&J, are looking at a version of ketamine, and I'll talk about that in a minute, called S-ketamine. And here in the United States, we have the mixed, which is the R and the S isomer of ketamine. And if you look here, this is just a flipped uh, version of the same uh, molecule or the same structure. And it has been shown, not available in the United States, but in Europe, is S-ketamine. It's two to three times more potent potent than the R-ketamine version. In the United States, we have the mixed version. Now, it's believed that this will result in lower risk for side effects, um, but we still do not know right, what the right dose is for the mixed version of ketamine, so perhaps people can uh, uh, respond just as well with lower doses without the side effects. Nevertheless, this appears to be better tolerated, and the studies are ongoing to see um, if they, it will be uh, more safer than existing versions of ketamine in the United States. Going to more subunit selective, ketamine is broad. It affects different subunits or components of this NMDA receptor. There are now compounds that are more selective. Here we see an oral form uh, of, of, uh, of uh, an, an MD antagonist that focuses on the NR2B subunit, and it's called MK0657. It's available in pill form. It was developed uh, by Merck, and now it's been picked up by Cericor to develop further. And we can see here that oral doses was not associated with psychomimetic effects, which is key and crucial because one of the concerns was, will we ever be able to develop ketamine-like drugs without the side effects? And the answer appears to be yes. Here we see improvement in depressive symptoms within five days, and we see also that increases BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is very important for maintaining those spines healthy, those synaptic connections that I mentioned earlier. And we see a electrophysiological measure showing that we decrease the activity in the anterior cingulate cortex. This is done by many different antidepressants, and also uh, it is done by deep brain stimulation. So it suggests that it is targeting the right um, area in the brain. Another compound is by AstraZeneca, referred to as AZD6765. It's available in intravenous formulation. It binds to the same target as ketamine, but not at the PCP site. And when it binds, it doesn't trap, uh, the compound is not trapped as much as ketamine. Ketamine literally shuts down the entire channel, as indicated by the higher number here, percentage whereas a drug like AZD6765 doesn't shut down, the channel permits normal function, thus memory cognition is not as disturbed as it would be for ketamine. So the theory would be that it would be better tolerated. Once again, the key question is, can we show that rapid antidepressant effects can be achieved without the dissociative side effects of ketamine? And the answer is yes. Here we see here that the present symptoms, down means better, and this is time in minutes and days. Rapid improvement of depressive symptom within minutes um, and lasting two days with one infusion. We don't see any dissociative, psychomimetic, or euphoric effects. 
suggesting that it's tolerant. And there is now evidence that repeat doses appears to be useful in treatment resistant depression, and those studies are underway. Third, by taking advantage of ketamine's rapid effects, we can use it as a tool to better understand how it works in the body, anywhere from the genes to the neurochemicals it affects to the circuits that it changes to uh, what we refer to as a rapid improvement of the complex behavioral phenotype, which in this case is depression. We are currently using a series of technologies. Polysomography, these are sleep studies. MRS looked at the neurochemical and in vivo measure of, of glutamate. We're looking at MEG, which is a device that looks at how one neuron in the brain talks to another neuron, it looks at the electrical activity uh, or communication between neurons in PET which measures glucose changes. Glucose is what the brain um, nourishes on. And this is to give you a few examples. Our, our colleagues at Yale, uh, Ron Duma and George Agajanian, did do some rodent studies looking at the importance of that BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor I mentioned, important in growth of neurons and the synapses. And when one looks at a SNP within valve 66 med, um, looking at pyramidal neurons, we can see the branches are very healthy, and that permits a good communication um, with the neurochemical and subsequent downstream effects. Whereas if you have the MET allele within that, um, you, you see that the, the apical dendrites are shriveled and atrophy, and that is reflected here by in animal studies you don't see as a good response to ketamine. Whereas with valve valve, you can see a rapid improvement in depressive symptoms, or at least the depressive phenotype in animals. So we decided to look at our cohort in collaboration with Yale University, look at our patients treated with uh, ketamine, um, separated by genotype. And if you had the valve valve, similar to what we found in animals, a much better improvement in depressive symptoms, down means greater improvement than if you had the MET allele. So this is a true translational study going from animals to humans and back and forth. And give us clues on where we should uh, pursue with uh, um, directions in terms of our research. Very elegant work by Ron Duman at Yano, Yano, uh, Yale University has proposed a, a theory um, and a model of ketamine and how scopolamine is the C sickness patch, but when given intravenously, also produces rapid antidepressant effects, and they seem to be mediated by this protein within the cell called mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin, which ultimately is responsible in part for increase in BDNF. There is an, a, a, another hypothesis where BDNF is uh, regulated in a different manner, but the end, end result is that there is an increase in the spine synapses number and function. If you recall, I talked about that in the beginning. And where in depression, he theorizes that there is a synaptic loss, these are synapses, caused by stress and depression. Whereas with rapid acting antidepressants such as ketamine, you rapidly restore those shriveled synapses or neurons within minutes you increase the spine number and the, the, the synapse number and function. Now this is uh, two experiments looking at how we can use circuits and uh, non-invasive procedures to, um, to test how well brain circuits are working in, 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 in the body. So here we expose someone to seeing pictures of fearful faces. You activate in any one of us the, the emotional part of the anterior cingulate cortex. And the greater the activation, the better the antidepressant response to uh, ketamine. If you look at a cognitive measure such as work and memory task, these are, this is a test trying to remember a telephone number I, I, I gave you. The greater the effort, the less the response. But if you have lower effort, the better response, meaning that your circuits in the brain that appear to be important in depression work adequately enough so that imparts a good response to ketamine. So these are non-invasive ways of determining beforehand whether someone might respond to ketamine. This is very preliminary work, but that suggests that this might be a useful uh, paradigm. Another is looking at um, uh, cortical excitability. If I give you a, a pneumatic device, I squeeze your fingers, 
you're going to produce a sensation in your sensory cortex, or matter sensory cortex here. What we are interested in is particularly in gamma power. You get different rhythms and different bandwidth. Gamma is important because it synchronizes different parts of the brain at the exact time. And we believe that is a surrogate for what I, I, I demonstrated earlier in terms of synapses and, and synaptic potentiation. So here we theorize the greater the gamma power to a stimulation, a sensory stimulus, the better response to ketamine. And that is the case. You can see here non-responders and responders at baseline. Post-ketamine, those who had the best response had greater increases of gamma power. Yet another example of how we might be able to, with ketamine as a tool to develop biomarkers so someday that we may be able to individualize or personalize our treatment, or for that matter, identify signatures that will lead to a better compound. Now, we are also interested in sleep and depression. Um, won't have much time to go into this, except there are different components. There's a circadian pacemaker. And ketamine influences one of our clock genes that regulates circadian rhythms. And we're going to talk about very briefly about plasticity. Plasticity is what I mentioned before, how, much, how many synapses there are and how well they talk, uh, one uh, neuron talks to another is what we refer to synaptic plasticity or potentiation. And one can do a sleep study to measure delta waves. It's an aspect of uh, sleep that I'll talk about. But basically, it's referred to as slow wave activity, SWA. It doesn't, um, it, it, it's a surrogate of synaptic potentiation, but we think it's very important in sync with brain-derived neurotrophic factors. Those are the factors that maintain the spine and the synapses healthy. And it's this interplay that appears important to the effects of ketamine. Normally, as one um, stays awake, synaptic strength and density increases. That one goes to sleep, there's a de-escalation, so the number of synapses and density goes down. So we would expect that the greater the time uh, goes by, the better the response with ketamine. And what we're doing with ketamine is mimicking some of this increased synaptic strength at the end of the day. There are a number of uh, techniques to look at slow wave activity or synaptic uh, potentiation. And one of them is, I mentioned, looking at polysomnography or sleep studies. Here you probably are familiar with the terms of REM, non-REM sleep, and we're particularly interested in delta or non-REM sleep, which is 0 0.5 to 4 hertz. We can see the high amplitude and frequency here. And we do know that ketamine increases slow wave activity. We also know that ketamine increases BNF. And so now we're going to look at the interplay between BNF and slow wave activity. This is an experiment we did looking at individuals or patients with treatment-resistant depression without medications, three sleep nights before ketamine, the night of ketamine, and the night after. And we look at their sleep patterns, low wave activity, and BVNF. And we find here that ketamine dramatically increases slow wave activity as we predicted. And you can see here yellow is the baseline of the delta waves, and we can increase it with treatment. And that when you look at responders, Compared to non-respond, these are patients with treatment-resistant depression. There was a good, strong relationship between this beating of this growth factor and the slow wave activity, which measures, we think, is a surrogate of that synaptic strength or the number of spine densities. And we can see here, the greater that relationship, the better the response. This has led to now moving to a translational aspect. Uh, Carrie Martinowicz has received a Marsat grant to study precisely this in animals, looking at uh, polysomnography, e, uh, sleep changes, look at slow wave activity, and looking at genetics, BDNF, to see what might be important or not to ketamine's antidepressant effect. An example of going back and forth between the bench and bedside. Now, how do I summarize what I just mentioned? Let's focus on mood very briefly and sleep. This is baseline. These are the variables. This is happens the day of ketamine, the day after ketamine. We know depression is up, indicated by high mantra, goes down with ketamine for several days, as we mentioned. Sleep also is poor total sleep. One is awake a lot. With ketamine, we see increased total sleep, decreased wake time. Then we start to look at two aspects, 
some things appear to be very important to the rapid and present effect of ketamine and others to maintain it. In terms of the neurotrophic, those are the, that's the fact that it maintains the spine healthy. We see it's decreased in depression at baseline, but with ketamine, it's increased very rapidly, but reversed. The same as um, the, uh, the, the, the slow wave activity, we mentioned goes up hand in hand with BDNF, this crosstalk, and goes down uh, the day after uh, 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 ketamine uh, effects. Now that's more involved in the media, but the sustain, that spine density, from down goes up and stays up. So these are two processes uh, apparently appear to be important. C to get into the last couple of slides, Carrie Martinovich has done a very nice uh, summary, and I invite you to read this paper, explaining everything that I just mentioned everywhere from binding to the NMDA receptors to increase in glutamate throughput to these changes in BDNF to the changes in synaptic plasticity and brain wave changes at the slow wave activity level. Finally, um, it, is there more to the ketamine paradigm? We know that ketamine is extensively metabolized by liver, cytochrome P450 system, and we can see there are a bunch of metabolites, the hydroketamine and the, uh, and, and the hydroxynorketamine metabolites. Some of these appear to uh, be uh, lasting more than uh, a few hours, as originally believed to happen with ketamine. But ketamine, we can see some lasting for several days, which might explain why uh, ketamine's effects last so long. It's perhaps not ketamine, but some of these metabolites that maintain the response. And we can see that some of them now appear to be useful in predicting who might respond or not to ketamine if you have bipolar uh, disorder. And more importantly, some of these metabolites don't have the effect at the NMD receptor. They have effects from off-site targets. So finally, um, to summarize, what I've tried to do is give an overview of the clinical uses of ketamine as being increasingly used in patients with treatment-resistant depression, and especially those with severe anxiety and other comorbidity. Um, it's an anti-suicidal effect, as represented here in the behavior and through systems level of biology to try to understand at the circuit level, at the cellular level, and even at the genetic level, what might be important to its effect. So naturally that there are many gaps here that we have to fill up in others, but um, I think it is going to be a very promising line of research, and hopefully that will lead us to develop in the next generation of treatments that work in hours as opposed to a day. So I'd like to stop there and thank you for your attention. Carlos, thank you very much for um, you, you were able to provide a lot of information, but in a way that I think is accessible to uh, lay people as well as the scientists that are uh, participating in the webinar. So thank you. Um, and uh, we have a number of questions. Um, and one relates um, to the issue of um, you know the the sustainability of a response. And how, how do you explain um, sort of the difference, in, and I, I like at the beginning when you spoke about um, a water faucet and, the, you know, different approaches to stopping a, uh, a leaky faucet, how do you explain the, the difference between the, sus the sustained um, response that people have um, to some of the more traditional treatments um, and the, you know, the fact that this doesn't continue after that period of time? Well, uh, I, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, we're talking about uh, the early response and the maintenance of response. And with any of our treatments, if we look at, if we were to give one dose of Prozac, uh, one dose of sertraline, or one ECT, or even one psych, uh, CBT intervention without completing the course, very unlikely we would have a response um, if we did it wouldn't be repeated unless it was uh, repeated continuously. And what I've been talking to you about mostly is that with one intervention to ketamine, we see enduring effects, which you would not see with a conventional treatment. So um, at, at the, uh, my colleagues at the basic science level have argued that there's two processes, and we also think uh, uh, the same way in humans, that with one intervention I'm talking about, 
you have this rapid increase of BDNF, uh, this rapid increase of uh, synapses within you know milliseconds. The number of synapses increases, the number of spines. There's more um, connection between the synapses and circuits very rapidly. In fact, uh, one can see an increase in spine density in, um, within one day very rapidly. Um, so there are these acute processes that probably have to do more with the synaptic potentiation or rapid increase of BDNF. And although crude, we are using uh, sleep as a surrogate for, for this um, process at a, a more basic level where we look at slow wave activity. Now we see in, 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 in the cartoon or one of the explanations that this rapidly increases but then another process takes over. I mentioned that spines go up within 24 hours uh, based on uh, preclinical work and seem to stay increased. Thus, we think that the structure there to permit you know, the, the communication between neurons and the ability to you know, receive the neurochemical and propagate it more downstream within the neurons is maintained there for uh, uh, several days or even for several weeks. So those are the two processes. Now, if you give one dose of a stimulant, you may experience an increase in activity levels of euphoria, but that rapidly reverses. So that's one possibility I mentioned, that two, process, uh, um, uh, two processes are involved. The other is that perhaps ketamine has more direct effects on an MDA receptor, um, and then that its metabolites have these off-site targets that maintain its effects. We don't know yet, but there's um, a lot of research going on to try to uh, separate these things. And then finally, we don't know if we were to give ketamine daily, if we were to, for example, develop a drug that ketamine-like that could be given on a daily basis, would you be able to continue maintaining that response? But nevertheless, that this is, uh, you, you do point out, Jeff, correctly, that this is something much different than our current treatments. And that's why we think uh, this is going to be a, a new avenue uh, with the potential of developing new compounds that are really different than existing ones. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question from um, a, a veteran um, who um, in the question says that he has post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and I want to, uh, first of all, take the opportunity to thank this person, I'm not mentioning names, uh, for his service to our country. And he is um, asking whether or not sort of asking about the use of ketamine in, in PTSD and also whether or not it is available in military hospitals at this point. So um, I, I think it's important to mention that ketamine is a, is a, is a Schedule three drug um, and um, it's um, available, it's, it's, uh, what we're talking about is uh, off-label use for depression, it's not FDA approved for the treatment of depression or PTSD or such a compulsive disorder. Um, nevertheless, clinicians are very savvy or getting experience in using, you know, now quite widely in the community. With regards to post-traumatic stress disorder, it, uh, it, it, it one may know or not that in the battlefield, especially, um, and this has been published in Military Magazine where a uh, journal um, where one of uh, people who were injured um, while in uh, while in combat or burned ketamine is frequently given uh, as an anesthetic agent because it also has significant uh, analgesic properties and so what they noticed when when our veterans were receiving ketamine in the ICU was that they recovered more quickly in terms of their uh, their in their medical injuries, they were less uh, impaired. Um, the, the length of hospitalization was much shorter and they had a better outcome. Um, again, this is uh, experience in the military. There was no significant increase in dissociative side effects. Um, nevertheless, there have been now some studies, one I think recently completed uh, at Mount Sinai, where they do, did look at uh, PTSD and then notice an improvement um, of post-traumatic stress symptoms um, very rapidly. But remember, this is in the one infusion paradigm, and particularly in those who had a company in depression, which is about 40% of individuals who have PTSD, did also improve. But the effects appear not to have been as sustained um, as, um, as in depression. Now, 
keep in mind this is one infusion is a very early study and we still do not know but um, one can imagine um, that if one were to intervene very rapidly with any intervention in the battlefield or immediately right any uh, right after any type of trauma um, non combat related as well that perhaps this could um, lead to um, a different course and and hopefully minimize the risk of the chronic PTSD. Good, good, thank you. Um, we have another question about the potential use of ketamine in teenagers. And I'm curious uh, what information we have about that at this point in time. Well, we do know that uh, ketamine is widely used uh, as a, uh, in children as an anesthetic. And, and, and remember that uh, the, the, the interest in ketamine as an anesthetic is that, one, when they receive it, they're more hemodynamically stable. That means their vital signs remain more stable. It doesn't affect breathing as much. And so contrary to most of the other anesthetic agents, they do the opposite. So that's why it's, it's viewed very favorably. Um, and uh, within uh, children, um, there have been some initial um, studies looking at intranasal ketamine in children, um, looking at what we call uh, um, with, with uh, a condition called harm avoidance. And uh, it's not really clear um, um, in, in the sense that these are children who apparently have uh, severe irritability, agitation, anxiety, and other features um, that is referred to as harm avoidance. And uh, reports, uh, I think in two dozen children, indicated uh, that they did have improvements. Um, other than that, there's very uh, little evidence uh, in children, um, um, except uh, I hear anecdotes here and there that it has been used intranasally in children. Now, uh, keep in mind that this is uh, and off-label use, um, and we know a lot less about uh, the use of these anesthetics, in, in particularly in, in children with uh, uh, severe mood disorders. And in you know, of course, uh, many children are still going through brain development, and we we don't know what the long-term consequences would be in the developing brain. And so I think more research is needed. But there is, I, uh, there are very exciting and, and promising reports in the community. Good. Thank you. Um, and we have a couple of questions also about um, people who have borderline personality disorder. And I'm curious what information you have about the use of ketamine in people with that diagnosis. Well, uh, in terms of ketamine and borderline personality uh, disorder, for, for our, our audience is referred to people who uh, may have um, unstable interpersonal relationships, may be impulsive. Um, uh, and this is a long pattern of behavior. Um, there are very few, if any, treatments approved. We are uh, generally repurposing antidepressants or mood stabilizers to help with this really unstable, um, emotional, uh, and impulsive uh, um, uh, syndromes and symptoms. So, in terms of, uh, there are no, no, there are no studies directly done in borderline personality disorder. However. I think it's important to keep in mind when one um, looks and studies uh, and treats treatment-resistant depression, um, there are many reasons for treatment-resistant status, but uh, including our individuals who had uh, who have syndrome, uh, who have um, um, uh, facets or traits of a personality disorder. One of them could be borderline personality disorder, so on and so forth. And so um, we have had. Um, experience where uh, individuals have been given the, name, uh, the label of borderline personality disorder in the context of severe incapacitating depression. And um, when the depression improved, we uh, did witness in, many, in several cases that the, the features of what we refer to as borderline personality disorder uh, rapidly improved. However, uh, I'm not saying that it has effects on borderline personality disorder. I'm saying that these are common characteristics that one might see in people with treatment-resistant conditions. And it's believed that when people uh, are severely ill, that some of these, uh, the, the coping adaptive mechanisms um, um, do not uh, work as well, and one might see a flare-up of these symptoms, which may be or not mistakenly uh, labeled as borderline personality disorder. But there, was, uh, there are no studies done 
uh, directly in borderline personality disorder, other types of personality disorder, but something um, that uh, uh, will be uh, evaluated and looked at in the future. Good, good, thank you. And moving to a little bit more about um, the important issue of bipolar disorder and depression. Um, the, what would you recommend to a person who um, has severe depression, hasn't responded to a multitude of treatments, um, and is, is looking for sort of something to, to try at this point in time? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so um, in my experience that have been, uh, when someone is referred to you as having um, treatment-resistant depression, the most important thing is to establish whether this person really has, whether our patient really has treatment-resistant depression. And generally about a quarter of our patients who come saying they had treatment-resistant depression do not, meaning they've not received adequate doses and durations of medications in a systematic manner. There are now several very nice treatment decision algorithms available where one could go through the hierarchy and steps necessary in the course of the treatment. Um, so I'm not advocating ketamine uh, early in the course of illness, but let's say that uh, our patient here um, has gone through all the decision steps and, and the necessary treatment. Um, how does uh, uh, how might ketamine work? Uh, well, at least in our studies in bipolar depression, it appears to have a rapid onset of antidepressant effects within a couple of hours in our individuals who've had um, uh, lithium and depakote in combination. And as I mentioned, the effects uh, seem variable, but in some patients could last uh, 10 days to several weeks. Now, uh, then if the question was, well, what I do after the ketamine infusion? Well, what has been remarkable, although I don't have any um, research data to support this as clinical um, impression, is that many of our patients who have gone through uh, ketamine or type of treatment, they seem to be more amenable to responding. Their, their neuro, there seems to be some changes in neurobiology where they seem um, to be more able to respond to medications that were not as effective before going through a ketamine. Now, I'm not saying that they respond totally, but they're, they, they seem to capture response much better than before. And that's just a clinical impre impression at this time. OK, but that's useful for somebody who really is has gone through, let's say they really have had full trials and sort of are trying to figure out what they might want to do next. Yes, and I, I would say that, uh, you know, in research settings uh, or even specialized uh, treatment centers that, that have expertise in treatment-resistant depression, um, it, 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 it could be seen as an option um, if one has gone through it. Um, I, I remind you that in our studies, 60% uh, had filled ECT, 7, 8 antidepressants, Many had failed um, the standard lithium, uh, quetiapin, anticonvulsants, and antipsychotic drugs. Okay. I, I do want to emphasize one important point, and you brought it up at the beginning in terms of lack of response, that a significant, you know, perhaps a third of people don't have a good response. But the good news is that two-thirds of people do have a good response to some of our traditional treatments. And I think that's an important point for people in our audience to realize many people don't even seek treatment, um, and many people don't get the full type of treatment that could bring about a response. Um, so the majority of people would respond to some of our more traditional treatments. Absolutely, and I think that's, uh, and as I mentioned uh, before, there are already decision trees, algorithms. Uh, on medications and even psychotherapeutic interventions that one can go through to really make sure they have tried everything possible and have been adhering to the uh, recommended and prescribed uh, treatment. And so generally if people go through that, there's a, a good chance of uh, responding. What we've been talking mainly about today in this uh, webinar is about uh, our patients who have uh, treatment-resistant depression have failed multiple antidepressants electroconvulsive therapy, and as a potential avenue to help people with treatment-resistant re uh, depression and develop in better treatment so that um, even down the, you know, you, you know, down the road in the next generation treatments, we might be able to come up with treatments that work in a couple of hours so that we would prevent that long-term malignant course from ever happening again. 
that which is so important for so many people. Um, Carlos, I want to thank you um, first and foremost for such an engaging presentation on such an important topic. And second of all, and even more importantly, for the research that you have done and that you're continuing to do. It provides tremendous hope um, for people who and their loved ones um, who have depression um, and bipolar depression and these other conditions that um, also can benefit from this treatment. So thank you very, very much. Well, thank you, Jeff. And I'd like to thank uh, the audience for uh, uh, joining us today at the webinar. Great. And I also want to thank our audience. And um, the, uh, I want to just remind our audience um, that um, the, uh, the foundation, through its research grants, is dedicated to improving the lives of people with psychiatric conditions. And um, all of the research that we fund is made possible through private donations. So if you'd like to make a gift, please visit bbrfoundation.org or call 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded, so if you missed any portion of it or would like to share it with a family or friend, please visit the webinar page at our website. Um, and I want to just invite people to join us again next month um, when we will hear from Dr. Judith Rappaport, a distinguished member of the Foundation Scientific Council and chief of the child psychiatry branch at the National Institute of Mental Health. She will speak to us about child onset schizophrenia. And that will take place on Monday, September 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. I want to thank everybody. And, um, and again, thank you, Carlos, for this presentation. Thank you. Take care. Take care, everyone. Goodbye.